Welcome to uh, another day as we go through the Word of God, and I'm so glad that you have joined me uh, because we are about to start a journey through the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. And I'm looking forward to going through this. It's a wonderful book, and it's a, an amazing start to the New Testament. Now, before we get into the uh, book of Matthew, uh, I want to just share with you a little bit about the history of it, uh, because that's very important. Um, and again, before I kind of dive too far down into that, just a reminder to follow all the links to uh, the, the, everything that I have, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, podcasts, whatever. Uh, and uh, please like, comment, subscribe and share. Uh, I think that this would be a wonderful book for you to be able to share with people and say, hey, listen, do you want to go through the book of Matthew with me and let's go through it. It's the story of Jesus. And, uh, and of course, it uh, just encapsulates so much <clears throat> pardon me, of who he is. Uh, the, the author of Matthew is actually not mentioned in the book. Um, and, uh, but you know, the, we, we get some clues some clues from uh, different parts of the book of Matthew. And uh, let me just read to you from, uh, you know, my favorite study Bible, the New King James uh, study Bible, and uh, which just says this about the author and uh, the date of when Matthew was written. Uh, the, the author knew the geography well. He was familiar with Jewish history, customs, ideas, and classes of people. He was well acquainted with the Old Testament and the terminology of the book suggests that the author was a Jew. Other details point specifically to Jesus' disciple as the writer of this gospel. As a tax collector, Matthew would have been literate and familiar with keeping records of money. Appropriately, this gospel contains more references to money than any of the others. Furthermore, Matthew's hometown was Capernaum, a village that is given special attention in this gospel and also one of my favourite places in Israel. Matthew wrote the gospel before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and he described Jerusalem in this book as the holy city as though it was still standing. So it's reasonable to conclude that this book was written somewhere between AD 50 and AD 60. Matthew uses the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of uh, God, those two terms, uh, you know, more than any other gospel. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is uh, used 33 times and the kingdom of God four times. Uh, and, and Matthew's gospel serves many different purposes uh, beyond just presenting a, a, a biography of Jesus. One purpose is to prove to Jewish readers that Jesus actually was the promised Messiah and the promised G uh, Jewish king. Uh, and the genealogy that is outlined in, in uh, Matthew chapter 1 points to Jesus as the one who inherited God's promises from directly from the line of David. Uh, and another purpose of this book is to outline the characteristics of the kingdom of God. Remember, Matthew talks about the kingdom of God more than any other gospel writer. And so he outlines the characteristics of the kingdom, both for Israel and the church. And that's interesting because Matthew is the only gospel writer who speaks directly of the church, that, that institution that it was necessitated by Jesus' rejection by his own people. And uh, that was the church that was set up by the Apostle Paul and Peter and the other disciples and is still in continuance continue today until Jesus returns. And Matthew points to the Gentile composition of the church uh, and includes several Gentiles faith stories that, you know, the wise men, the centurion, the Canaanite woman. Uh, and so it kind of outlines who, what this church is going to look like. Uh, basically anybody who accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour and his free gift of salvation. And then the final purpose of Matthew really is to instruct the church. And an obvious clue is to this is the end of his uh, writing where he talks about the Great Commission uh, to go into all the world, teaching them all the things uh, that I have commanded you to do. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, four gospel writers, four different personalities, four different styles. Matthew's style was topical. He did not write his book in a chronological order. Uh, it's in topical order. He uses a grammatical device called inclusio uh, during his writings. What does that mean? That means that uh, he would, it, there, was, there were no you know, necessarily uh, uh, punctuation as there would be in English. 
And so there were grammatical devices used to say this is the beginning of a topic and this is the end. And what they would do is write the same words at the beginning and the end and say everything else, everything contained in between when you read those two sentences or those two statements, uh, it includes everything that you need to know about that topic. One of those examples is the topic of healing. And uh, and if you, we, we just to, to quickly look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, uh, it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And then if you uh, scoot over to Matthew 9.35, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So everything that you need to know about what Jesus taught on healing can be found between in the book of Matthew between verses 420, uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 23 and chapter 9, verse 35. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of how Matthew wrote his book. Now, Malachi was the last book of the Old Testament. It was written in about 420 BC at our best estimate. And Matthew was written around 50 AD. So you've got about a 470, roughly 500 year gap uh, between the two books being written. So having said that, let's dive in to the book of Matthew. And today we are going to be looking at Matthew verses 1 through to 17. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew presents his theme in the first verse. Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy and Israel's expectation. Uh, Matthew begins his account of the life of Jesus Christ. And from the statement in the ancient Greek text, it's, it's kind of difficult to tell what the book of the genealogy refers to, which is what he says, the book of the genealogy. Uh, but the first two words of Matthew in the Greek are biblios gentios, and they can be translated record of the genealogy, record of the origins, or record of the history, uh, according to Carson. And there's a sense in each which uh, each meaning is, is valid. Now, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 17, which is what we're going to look at today, we have the record of the genealogy. In Matthew 1, verses 18 to Matthew 2, verse 23, we have the record of the origins. And then the entire book, the 28 chapters of Matthew, we have the record of the history. Now, Matthew was a former tax collector. He was also known as Levi. Uh, and so he was very qualified to write an account of Jesus' life and teachings. Uh, a tax collector of those in that day would have to know Greek. He'd have to be illiterate, have to be very well organized. And some people think of Matthew as being the recorder, uh, if you like, of uh, you know, the disciples of Jesus' teaching. He's one that took notes. Um, and really, Matthew followed Jesus. He left everything behind, and that would have meant everything. Matthew probably lost more than any of the disciples when he followed Jesus because there was, uh, he, was, he was already not well respected and uh, and. He really did go all in for Jesus. And, uh, but he, was, he would have been very good at using a pen and paper because he was a tax collector and knew about taking notes. So uh, William Barclay says this, Matthew nobly used his literary skill to become the first man ever to compile an account of the teaching of Jesus. Now, what was his social standing, uh, Matthew? Uh, again, William Barclay, we know that he was a tax gatherer, collector, and that he must therefore have been a bitterly hated man, for the Jews hated the members of their own race who had entered the civil service of their conquerors. So tax collectors would bid to Rome to become a tax collector of their fellow Jews. And what, how they would bid is say, if you let me be a tax collector, I'll give you 23% and I'll only keep 77, or I'll give you 77, I'll only keep three, or I'll give you 90, and I'll only keep 10. And that's how they would bid, and then the Romans would say, okay, well, you, you can be a tax collector. Uh, and that's kind of how it worked. Now, Matthew then goes on and says that Jesus Christ is the son of David and the son of Abraham. These are not words to be thrown away. They're very important because in this overview of explaining the lineage of Jesus, Matthew very clearly and strongly connects him to some of the greatest men in the Old Testament, Abraham and David. Now, Matthew begins his account of the life of Jesus Christ with the lineage of Jesus from the patriarch Abraham. And 
Though most New Testament scholars believe that the Gospel of Matthew was maybe not the first of the four written, uh, it, it, it is very well placed to be the very first book of the New Testament. Uh, and there's a few reasons why the Gospel of Matthew belongs as the first book of the New Testament. Let me read some of them to you. Uh, France says this, It is a remarkable fact that among the variations in the order in which the Gospels appear in early lists and texts, the one constant factor is that Matthew always comes first. Uh, the early Christians rightly saw the Gospel of Matthew as important because it had some very significant portions of Jesus' teaching that are not included in the other Gospels. Uh, it has the fullest version of the Sermon on the Mount. It was the only one of the Synoptic Gospels, uh, which the Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The book of John focuses more on the divinity of Jesus and includes things that aren't necessarily in the other three. The other three contain a synopsis of Jesus' life and ministry. That's why they're called the Synoptic Gospels. And uh, Matthew is the only Synoptic Gospel to have one of the apostles as its author, the, you know, the Apostle Matthew, who was also known as Levi. Uh, the, the Jewish flavor of the Gospel of Matthew makes for a very logical transition between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, and so the early church placed it first in order among the four Gospels because it was the most obviously Jewish. Uh, and now, how is the Jewish character in the book of Matthew evident? Well, there, there were many indications in the book of Matthew that uh, that he would expect his readers to be familiar with Jewish culture. Uh, let me give you some examples. Number one, Matthew doesn't translate Aramaic terms such as raka in Matthew chapter five or Corbin. Uh, Matthew refer, you know, so therefore he knows that they would know what they meant. Uh, Matthew refers to Jewish customers, customs uh, with no explanation. Uh, in Matthew 23, 5, he talks about making their phylacteries broad. Okay, that's the things that they would wear on their head uh, to, to uh, a little mini version of the temple that would have the writings of the Torah inside it. It says they make their, their, their huge. They want people to know that they've got the word of God close to their head. Um, so again, something that would only be familiar to a Jewish reader. He starts his genealogy with Abraham, the father of the Jews. Uh, he presents the name of Jesus in a way that people would understand its Hebrew roots. Matthew 1.21, he will save his people from their sin, his people. Uh, he frequently refers to Jesus as the son of David. Uh, he uses the more Jewish phrase, kingdom of heaven, uh, instead of the other phrase, the kingdom of God. But significantly, the Gospel of Matthew ends with Jesus commanding his followers to make disciples of all nations. So the Gospel of Matthew uh, is deeply rooted in Judaism, but at the same time, it's able to look beyond that and it sees the Gospel more as a message, more than just a me message for the Jewish people, but it's a message for the whole world. Uh, David Guzik says this, we also see that Matthew is deeply critical of the Jewish leadership and their rejection of Jesus. To say that Matthew is pro-Jewish is incorrect. It is better to say that he is pro-Jesus and presents Jesus as the authentic Jewish Messiah, whom sadly many of the Jewish people, especially the religious establishment, rejected. Now, Matthew also called Jesus the son of David, and throughout the Gospel of Matthew, G Matthew, he presents Jesus as the kingly Messiah uh, that would be promised from David's royal line. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, Jesus was prophesied by the prophet Nathan that he would physically come from the seed of David so that he would have to have a, 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 a link to David. Um, now, in the very first sentence of the book of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, Matthew points to Jesus as the fulfillment of that Old Testament prophecy. And then he says he's the son of Abraham. So not only does Matthew connect Jesus to David, he connects him to Abraham, which is back even further. Jesus is the seed of Abraham in whom all nations would be blessed. Genesis chapter 12 says that this is what would happen. And here we have Matthew in the very first verse, the first words of, of the first book of the New Testament, establishing Jesus' Jewish Messiah credentials. 
uh, which is absolutely amazing. So then let's read through the genealogy because it's very, very important. Whenever you see genealogies in the Bible, they are there for a reason. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah. By Tamar, Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse. Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam. Rehoboam begot Abijah. Abijah begot Azar. Azar begot Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat begot Joram. And Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham. Jotham begot Ahaz. And Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh. Manasseh begot Amon. And Amon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel. And Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel begot Abiud. Abiud begot Eliakim. And Eliakim begot Azor. Azor begot Zadok. Zadok begot Achim. And Achim begot Eliud. Eliud begot Eleazar. Eleazar begot Methan. And Methan begot Jacob. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. This genealogy establishes Jesus' claim to the throne of David through his adoptive father, Joseph. Now, this is not the blood lineage of Jesus through Mary, but the legal lineage of Jesus through Joseph. And the Gospel of Luke provides Jesus' blood lineage through Mary. F.F. Uh, F. Bruce says, The Jews set much store by genealogies, and to the Jewish Christians, the Messiahship of Jesus depended upon it being proved that he was a descendant of David. Now, there are some genuine problems in sorting out the details of this genealogy and reconciling some of the points between Luke's record and those found in the Old Testament. Because the author of Matthew here is, is persuaded that the, the geneal genealogical record of Joseph and the, and the Luke record of Mary, uh, but this is not accepted without dispute by some. Uh, Carson says this, Few would guess simply by reading Luke that he is giving Mary's genealogy. The theory stems not from the text of Luke, but from the need to harmonize the two geneal genealogies. On the face of it, both Matthew and Luke aim to give Jesus genealogy. Nevertheless, genealog genealogical difficulties shouldn't prevent us from seeing the whole. Matthew Poole acknowledged that there were, there were some problems with the genealogies and in reconciling the records of Matthew and Luke, but he very rightly observed this, that the Jews kept very extensive genealogical records. So it's not unwise to trust those kinds of records. We also have to remember Paul's warnings uh, about striving over genealogies and not to get into arguments about them that he, you know, he wrote in uh, you know, 1 Timothy, Titus uh, chapter 3. And this very important point, if Jewish opponents of Jesus could have actually demonstrated that Jesus was not descended from David, they would have disqualified his claim to be Messiah there and then. But they didn't and they couldn't. So, so therefore, we can, we can look at this as an established genealogical fact. Now, uh, Poole says this, Therefore, it is the most unreasonable thing imagine, imaginable for us to make such little dissatisfactions grounds for us to question or disbelieve the gospel because we cannot untie every knot we meet within a pedigree. Now, the Jewish interest in genealogies could, could sometimes be a distraction, which is why Paul warned Timothy to guard against those who were fascinated by endless genealogies. And he gave a similar warning, as we mentioned in Titus. So let's talk about who all these people were in this list, because that's incredibly important. Spurgeon said this about this list of people we just read in the genealogy. With one or two exceptions, these are the names of persons of little or no note. 
The later ones were persons altogether obscure and insignificant. Our Lord was a root out of dry ground, a shoot from a withered stem of Jesse. He set small store by earthly greatness. Okay, this genealogy is firstly noted for its unusual presence of four women, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and her who had been the wife of Uriah. <laughs> and we're going to talk about her. Um, now, women were very rarely mentioned in ancient genealogies, but the four who are mentioned here are worthy of special note as examples of God's incredible grace because they show how God can take very unlikely people and use them in incredibly wonderful ways. Now, Tamar was somebody who sold herself as a prostitute to her own father-in-law, Judah, so that she could then bring, uh, give birth to Perez and Zerah, the twins, that, uh, that, that jostled in her womb. And you can read that story in Genesis chapter 38. Then you've got Rahab, the prostitute. She's a Gentile prostitute. And God took incredible message, uh, measures to save her uh, from both judgment and her lifestyle of prostitution. You can read about her uh, story in Joshua chapter 2 through to Joshua chapter 6. Then you've got Ruth. She was a Moab, uh, a Moabitess. Uh, and she was a Gentile until she converted and uh, came into the covenant of Israel in Ruth. And you can read about her story in the book of Ruth, an amazing story. Uh, just what she did, and to think that Jesus then flowed out of her. And then you've got Bathsheba. Bathsheba, her who had been the wife of Uriah. Uh, she was an adulteress. She was famous, uh, or, or I should say infamous, for her sin with David, chronicled in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And Carson says this, Matthew's peculiar way of referring to her, Uriah's wife, may be an attempt to focus on the fact that Uriah himself was not an Israelite, but a Hittite. Now, these four women have a very important place in the genealogy of Jesus. And to demonstrate that Jesus was not royalty, according to human perception, in the sense that he didn't come from this incredibly wonderful aristocratic background. All four of these women have an important place in the genealogy of Jesus to demonstrate that Jesus identifies with sinners in his own genealogy. Uh, even as he does through his own birth and his baptism, his life, his death on the cross, Spurgeon said this, Jesus is heir of a line in which flows the blood of the harlot Rahab of the rustic Ruth. He is akin to the fallen and to the lowly, and he will show his love even to the poorest and most obscure. Now, these women also uh, have an important place in the genealogy of Jesus because they show that there is a new place for women in the new covenant. Just uh, as they had been used in the old covenant, there was a new place for them in the new covenant. Because in both the pagan and the Jewish culture of the day, Men had very little regard for women. And, and, and in that era, some Jewish men even woke up every morning and they prayed to God and said, thank you for not making me a Gentile, a slave or a woman. <laughs> and that was an amazing prayer to pray. Despite that, uh, women were regarded more highly among the Jews than they were even among the pagans. So what does that say about what they were, how they were respected by the pagans? William Barclay said this, by far the most amazing thing about this pedigree is the names of the women who appear in it. Um, Maya says this, uh, men and women notorious for their evil character lie in the direct line of Jesus' descent. This was permitted that he might fully represent our fallen race. Okay, then you've got right down to Jesus' earthly father. Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Matthew wanted to make it clear that Jesus, Joseph sorry, was not the father of Jesus, but he was the husband of Mary. Uh, France says this, The new phraseology makes it clear that Matthew does not regard Jesus as Joseph's son physically. And this genealogy is clearly intended to be that of Jesus' legal ancestry, not of his physical descent. Now, let's read Matthew uh, 1, verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David 
until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Here, Matthew makes it very clear that this genealogy is in fact not complete because there were not actually 14 generations between the points that he indicates. Uh, but Matthew edited this list in order to make it easy to remember and memorize. For example, uh, Matthew chapter 1 verse 8 says, Joram begot Uzziah. Well, this is Uzziah, king of Judah, who was struck with leprosy for daring to enter the temple uh, as a priest to offer incense. So good intentions, but he wasn't meant to be there. It didn't all go too well for him. Now, Uzziah was not the immediate son of Joram. There were actually three kings between them, uh, ah Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah. Uh, yet, as William Clark rightly says, it is observed that omissions of this kind are not uncommon in Jewish genealogies. The practice of skipping generations at times was common in the listing of ancient gene genealogies. And Matthew did absolutely nothing unusual by leaving some of these generations out. Now, another royal or another part of the royal line that Matthew passed over was in between Josiah and Jeconiah. Uh, and his name was Jehoiakim uh, or Jehoiakim. Uh, now, Jehoiakim was so wicked that through the prophet Jeremiah, God promised that no blood descendant of his would ever sit on the throne of Israel. Jeremiah 36 verse 30. Now, this presented a very significant problem because if someone was a blood descendant of David through Jehoiakim, then he couldn't sit on the throne of Israel and be the king and the Messiah because of the curse that was presented against him in Jeremiah 36. But if the conqueror was not descended through David, he could not be the legal heir to the throne because of the promise made to David and the nature of his own royal line. So this is where the genealogies of Matthew and Luke combine and harmonize because Matthew recorded the genealogy of Joseph, the husband of Mary, who was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. And he began at Abraham and followed the line down to Jesus through Joseph. Luke recorded the genealogy of Mary uh, being, and in Luke chapter three, Mary, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, Jesus. And, and Luke begins with Jesus and follows the line back up all the way to Adam. He doesn't stop at Abraham. He goes all the way to Adam and he starts from the unmentioned Mary. Now, each genealogy is the same uh, in relation to how it records uh, from Adam or Abraham all the way down to David. But a David is where the two genealogies separate. Now, if you remember the genealogy or the story or list of David's sons in 2 Samuel chapter 5, you can see that Satan focused his attention on the descendants of the royal line through Solomon, a, a, a very reasonable strategy to try and make sure that Jesus couldn't, uh, couldn't come about. Now, according to Matthew 1 verse 6, Joseph's line went through Solomon uh, and therefore Jehoiakim, who was the cursed one. So Jesus was the legal son of Joseph, but he was not the blood son of Joseph. So the curse on Jehoiakim did not affect Jesus. Joseph didn't contribute any of the blood of Jesus, but he did contribute to his legal standing as a descendant of the royal line. Uh, Mary's line, the bloodline of Jesus, did not go through Solomon, but through a different son of David, Nathan. And Mary was therefore not part of that blood curse on the line of Jehoiakim. So we're going to break there. Isn't it amazing that even though men and women messed up, God was able to orchestrate Jesus' seed coming from David and Abraham without compromising his legal status. That just blows my mind. And that's what Matthew starts his gospel with, blowing our mind about who Jesus is and establishing his credentials about being the Christ and Messiah before he launches in to the ministry and the birth of Jesus Christ. It's amazing. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful uh, opportunity just to explore, uh, God, your, your goodness and your intricacies of how you work in the lives of each of us as you did in Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.